So you guys are all here for an afternoon of poetry with four incredible poets. Um, the first poet is Pamela Murray Winters, and she is the author of The Unbeckonable Bird, a poetry collection published by Future Cycle Press in 2018. She has an MFA in poetry from Vermont College of Fine Arts. She is at work on a second full-length collection of poems and a few chapbooks. Pam lives in Maryland with her husband in a small menagerie. All right, Pam, if you want to unmute yourself. Thank you very much. My, my small menagerie appears to be tearing something apart under my guest bed, but we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, thank you all for uh, coming to this, and thank you especially to the Writer Center. Um, I know I, I listed my MFA, but really... I got so many good classes at the Writers' Center and hope to take more in the future. So it's definitely a great endeavor. And uh, looking forward to reading to you today. I can find my poems. There we go. Um, the first poem, um, actually all of these poems, or most of these poems, have some sort of a mu musical connection. I uh, didn't really plan it that way. It's just, just what happened. And the first poem and some of the others are from my book, The Unbeckonable Bird, which I think you can see there. Um, and there will be information on how to get the book if I think everybody I know has bought it already. So <laughs> anyway, this is called Hoisting the Pretend Sail. Later, I learned my favorite home was away. My favorite songs came in tabletop jukeboxes in bus stations, en route to the tombs of unknown cousins. My favorite candies were the ones you broke with a hammer or both your hands. Bark, brittle, sugar rock, the necklace that rained the rainbow O's with the snap of a cord. They'd dent your palms, draw blood in the mouth, and later raise welts on the tender buds. Drunk on dad's root beer and being five and a half, I'd collage a life from the rings and swords that fell from the gumball slot. Not for me the chewy cherry cigar, the white powder smokes. I wanted handfuls, foreign cargo, salvaged moments on my tongue. And not for me the life you earn, but the one you collect. Bits, bins, barnacles. But that was a way. When my mind was loose as the sea, as young as the sea is old, when I could say, I'm a princess, a pirate, a tabby cat, and make it so. Adulthood, this is the worst trip. Uh, my second poem is also from my book, and it alludes to a band called the, Missis the North Mississippi All-Stars, who I saw on a cruise ship and uh, began writing this poem in the audience. Uh, the band is led by two brothers, and you'll hear about them here. It's called Born in Deep Elm. Luther's singing about keeping your lamp trimmed and burning. But Cody's turned his back to us on his drum throne and combs his thin hair with his black comb into a wet DA. Cowboy hat aside, with a towel he wipes and grooms, elbows like a cat, like he's forgotten the show or he's ready for the spot. Because Luther's got the music running up and down those long legs, fingers, face. But Cody is the music. Some accident in utero, some slip, and he's unhinged, all out, no in. And Luther will learn everything, will lean and yearn and spoon and swoon. We'll bend the strings and bring the dials into thrall. His mojo will slide up and nudge you. Cody will get inside and mess you up, all sharp and flat and blat and never stop smiling. He's seven kinds of wrong. Music has rules just to smack sin into fun, a dance, a fall. Sprawled on the deck, the sun scorching your eyes, mouths bleeding, probably concussed and shouldn't sleep, and something beating in your mind could kill you, but move those legs just right. Spit a croon, and you'll rip into a grin. Um, before I was a poet, or before, between times of my being an active poet, uh, I worked on, uh, I was a music writer, and I worked on an autobiography of Sandy Denny that was never published. 
And this is a short poem about that called Glove Box, which refers to the scientific apparatus, a glove box, not something in a car. <laughs> Reaching in, I smell the blue cotton of your dress, taste your smoke, touch the red hairs of the dog. I am a pair of hands, a pair of eyes, some half a mind, heart split as elbows bent. I search rooms I can only imagine. I pray for ghosts, but the doorway is bare. I hear songs. Should that have been enough? They say you never enter a room without taking something, without leaving something. And I wonder what of me I leave on you as I pull back. This is going to be what I suspect is the first, the first of the COVID poems uh, today. Um, I haven't written many, but this is a musical poem, which talks about Hal Wilner, who uh, was the music director of Saturday Night Live for many years, did many other great things. Amazing, amazing person, Hal Wilner. Uh, it's called Rapture. I was going to list them, the musicians swept away by April, but it was too much and too little. Experts tell us singing together will kill us. We cover our lips. Fear rattles our throats. The bodies fill the rinks as life ends far away. Memorials on screens. No scent of lilies. No trumpets. You can't stop music. A friend of a friend gets her husband to drive the red truck while she sits in the bed banjo and voice ringing, a parade to celebrate looking out your window. In Manhattan, friends keep the window shut, but even they open to bang pots and ring bells and shout hosannas as the nurses go off to trenches. From his sickbed in the epicenter, Hal Wilner, impresario, writes, I always wanted to have a number one, but not this. Then the next day, Sending love to John Prine, who is in critical condition. Send good thoughts his way. It's his last post before April does its thing. Let's say Hal and John hold hands as they wait in line. Let's pretend they're press-ganged onto that silent ship. You can imagine, can't you, that Hal, helpless before a tune, would be raptured by a siren god? I have a little more time than I thought I did, so I'm going to squeeze in a poem that I often read. It's called Blessing. After we got our VIP wristbands, they led us through to meet Jesus. The green room was smaller than we expected. He had changed from his robes into a chambray shirt and dockers, his feet modestly clad in white socks and tevas. He still had that aura, though the scent of cloves and mown grass. I got snookered into taking camera after camera to shoot souvenirs, the old grip and grin. It seemed polite to ask for a photo of my own. His embrace was warm, brotherly, only a bit damp, and I felt supreme love and deep foolishness in equal portions. My companions yelled, say Christmas. I murmured, I feel stupid. The Lord said, everyone feels stupid. It's okay. And I'll finish up with this one. Um, it's called Blessed Are the Cheese Makers. For without them, what tops our crackers? Just eat one bare and try to whistle. Not Dixie, we don't do that now. But me and Julio, calamity as rollick, as sung by a guy accused of appropriating could plead love, just as I would have. Scotch-Irish, Maryland kid, dancing flamenco to scratched records, begging to be remembered to Harold Square, whoever he was. Cheese, manna of my people, blessed Velveeta, blessed orange blocks in boxes handed to the poor that they might make sandwiches. I thought I was dying on the eve of my 56th birthday, my heart flailing and stomping, as the name tags in the ER said, bear down like you're having a bowel movement. 
which I couldn't get my head or bells around. And then the tall doc pressed on my abdomen and said, resist, a word I would come to know well in 2017. And I resisted and went calm as a miracle and told them I was hungry. Not famine, not poverty, just middle class, middle aged, absent mindedness. They brought me yellow matter on white bread, tasting of the machine it was pre born in. And I ate it and rested and was God blessed happy to be alive. Thanks very much. Thank you, Pam. Wow, a cheese poem right in the middle of lunchtime. <laughs> it's making me hungry. All right, thank you for those poems. Um, and I'm going to put the information to purchase your book again in the chat. Um, also, while I have everyone's attention turned to the chat, if you have questions, we should have time for a short Q&A portion at the end of the reading. So I'll be monitoring the chat to pull questions out. Um, feel free to drop them in there as they come to you. Um, all right, moving on to our next reader. We have Susan Sandy. Susan is an award-winning poet and a short story writer. Her debut collection, In the Long Boats with Others, won the Capricorn Book Award and was published by New Rivers Press. The Arsonist, her fifth collection, was released in 2019 from Main Street Rag. Her sixth collection, Evenings at the Table of an Intoxicant, was a finalist in the New Rivers New Voices 2019 contest. The Last Insomniac, a chapbook, now working its way to a full collection, was a 2019 finalist in the James Tate Award. Grants and awards include a National Endowment Award in Poetry, grants in Fiction and Poetry from the Maryland State Arts Council, the Gordon Barber Memorial Award from the Poetry Society of America. Her collection, The Chalk Line, was a finalist in the National Poetry Series. Individual poems have appeared in Barrow Street, the North American Review, the Southern Humanities Review, the Mississippi Review, American Letters and Commentary, Bomb, New Letters, Southern Poetry Review, and many others. Oh, I think we just need to unmute. Yeah, I'm go. unmuted now. Perfect. Okay. Um, well, the, the last Insomniac is now complete, and I'm working on a new collection, which is called the, uh, temporarily, perhaps, I don't know, maybe this will be its final title, The Crossed Out Wife. And so I will read three poems, the first one is from The Crossed Out Wife, and it is about aging. The years revise your anatomy, and your limbs fall lank with the moon. You've lost your watercolor motility, a young face, innocent as sand under the wind's blows, but surely not your own, smiles out of a big black picture frame. The clock on your night stands a hundred years old, and every morning it forgets to wake you. The skin on your face has been burgled more than once by the same second story man, and in the mirror now you're barely a streak. Your eyes, those two blue entries to the soul, have been sealed off by cataracts, opaque as stone, but in the interim, have grown fluent with the diorama circling in the dark behind them. Your right to be born again's being tampered with. You who were the fire that danced in winged shoes, your cells a pot of hot stew won't be replenished. The master key to longevity resides with no sous chef. You won't die from carrying the weight of a sandwich board, won't be pistol whipped. Your occupancy here will become an old age home and the doors won't leave your rooms. There in the space with you, something indistinct lines the walls, creeps from the unlit halls, the hiss of an object burning that shouldn't the whoomph of engine parts, the rattle of exhaust. And for a heartbeat, you're a small muscle car permitted a slit of a view. Body reliable again, 
air an invocation lending gravity to your every move. Like incense at an altar, you don't question it. All you really have is vocabulary, cold and undigested. Then the lights you wear, the warm brewed lamp of consciousness burns low. More heat won't resurrect it. You start to curl, toothless, arboreal. The woods are full of stories like this, blight in the beaches rot in the oaks, whatever the disease, times contiguous, the wards are full. Your threads go lost, the signals that rise from the trough to which you're tethered can no longer be sent. The gristle and gut, the proof inside of you that once you existed, like a poor man's glossary, breaks trail and the cells divide against themselves. But see, there's room still for mutterings, a friable cache of words, half-forged things, what our ancestors spoke, the hum before the dark comes down over and between us. I should add, I'm going to be an octogenarian this year uh, in a month and uh, after, well, in November. So I'm kind of focused on uh, aging. <clears throat> and I don't like it. <laughs> I don't like it one bit. This poem, which is called Dystymia, just another word for chronic depression, is in my collection, another collection that's uh, also circulating, Evenings at the Table of an Intoxicant. And the, and the intoxicant is, is someone who, uh, has, it's not about drink, it's about uh, being bipolar and uh, having wonderful episodes of hypomania, which I, I have. Anyway, the darkling sky gnaws on its chains again today, those parts of things that once were human, the wildly compounded eye like an ox in the breast. You feel it breathe there, a thin decant of the self that wants to be fed an unbroken stillness. And you, with your hands on your life, the fidgets of your pain at its ever-changing stain, so fiercely tenacious with the only body you can sacrifice. It touches your name, your capital I, carries you through winter for dismemberment in snow, hibernates and wakes again in the chill of nightmare, in mirrors where you lay your simulacra. You recognize yourself for a while, features distorted by normalcy. This is its wingless phase, pupa beginning to morph. You vanish behind your senses, your tear ducts won't work or spherals hidden inside them. Your porous, soft touches of bliss have faked it, caught you in free fall, incessant vertigo. This isn't the right bandage, the circle it forms, not heaven. Arch above the world, not blind, but an obdurate iridescence, light of an alternative heaven count breaths. Fully being is death not remembered. Your body's your memory, piece of path, artless black. Your form on the pillow at night hums. You brush and hug it in its porcelain apparel and it breaks. Touch the silence of turning with words. Your words are erudite. When you step from the curb, small dark city, what cab do you hail to go where with? None come to fetch you back. Your pocking shadow's been annulled by the sun. Your body sent to its forever end, milled with branches the deities call home. Your contours fleeting drizzle apart in the stars, making more room for the cosmos. Suffer the insects and children 
can't tell which blossom of itch rises to the foreground and nothing's holier than a can of worms. And uh, the last one um, again is from the, the crossed out wife. It's called Juggernaut of the Lonely Obsessed. Cord that wraps itself around our necks, burns our stables, steals our horses, parches our overalls, teaches the knights and their logias to fear us. The days come just to give our knights a break, show love and be loved. A smile might beget a pterodactyl or two to emerge from the hem of its ancient shirt. The feathered minion it's been toting since prehistory's birth. Poor, dumb humans, your minds ruminate too much, then overinflate like pig's bladders filling with asterisks. Your blood percolates on no back burner, grabs whatever of its heart the night cares to toss it. The crumbs your tables host, so small the ants are first to see them. You barbecue on spits what's left, and the Santa Ana winds grab your fires and spread them. As pioneers, you have needs like your fathers before you. The great dark night of history shows you exploring the new world as you first saw it in your imaginations. Oh, gluttony, how you ate from it, giant stew pot whose contents you treated as endless. Your boundaries have never known limits. You saddle fault lines with A-frames and mansions and watch the earth swallow them. Your tract homes go up in matchstick forest. No's not an answer you acknowledge. It's the no you've worked on saying for years. Quicker than the beating of a hummingbird's heart, you find yourself marinating in the everlasting dark, attributing the loss of light to poor vision, the encroaching clouds to cataracts, or the ceaseless caterwauling of feral cats. The dust on your sills transitions easily to hardship. Your bodies go forth daily into suffering, Foxes repeatedly raid your hen house. Wolves long ago took down the cow. The death wings stopped orbiting and lands alongside your pale brows. Ice that shouldn't breaches your vineyards. The cold stone of unexpected winter gut punches the ground you stand on. Your washing machines stop washing, and all over America, women's hands grow raw from scrubbing death's laundry. Poor, dumb humans, to wake you find is to die, and when all's gone awry, death seems not so bad an option. It possesses a mouth like a teacup, holds the contents of an ocean, Drowning in it's a sure thing. You take off in a multiplicity of ill-fated directions and turn into corpses piling up for the earth to mourn. Goodbye, life, say yourselves before you've done with them. No more parties, no first-run movies. One take is all you get in this raw and bloody epic you've created. Bamboozled out of dreams by your own great leaders, carnival barkers and game show hosts posing as great leaders, judge and jury of the gray and fleeing hordes, pistol whipped and sentenced to unbreachable walls, forced to make license plates and bungee cords for travelers and sexual deviants. On the hills above, behind their padlocked gardens, sit the summer houses of the aging rich. Like them, the world's old, talks philosophy at all hours, is wobbly in the knees. It lies awake in the pink-mouthed afternoons, ghost-writing its nap thoughts on cobweb typewriters. 
And when the night comes, bringing insomnia in its claws, and the trees argue too loudly with the wind, they rise and prowl the halls, pull the pollen-colored shades on the existential glow coming from clouds of fireflies. Poor, dumb humans. No one knows your expanding immensity with all its empty spaces better than angels and demons. Even death can't figure you out and harbors the suspicion that you don't exist. But for the dog who answers to your whistle, the searchlights in the guard towers of prisons, acts of torture, the rats that follow your ships through the knotted sleeves of water. When thirsting, you lick your breath off glass, hands white at the knuckles, you pee in public waterways as if they were your toilets, leaving drops compact in their anonymity. You speak and always exist. It's as if you were on the brink of some deeper utterance, some harsher reckoning, but you never quite make it. It must be the wind eulogized and measured coming from galactic shores like the screech of a scaffold hung by a leather strap high up where thoughts converge or the weight of apocalyptic events climbing everyone's back, caught in the headlights of a gray twilight that goes missing. Thank you so much. And I forgot to thank you for hosting us and the Writers' Center and for everybody. Um, thank you, Pam, for everybody that's here. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for those poems. I'm putting the link to purchase the book once again in the chat. Um, I mean, it's just a reminder of how incredible it is to sit and hear poetry and so different from reading it on the page. Um, I think the sounds... And the rhythm really just came through in those. And I believe there's some comments in the chat um, with similar notes too. So thank you for that, Susan. All <laughs> right. Our next reader is Lola Haskins. Lola Haskins poetry has appeared in The Atlantic, The Christian Science Monitor, The London Review of Books, Georgia Review, Southern Review, Prairie Schooner and elsewhere. Her 13th collection of poems is Asylum Improvisations on John Clare. The, the collection previous to that was How Small Confronting Morning, set in the woods and waters of inland Florida. Her prose work includes an illustrated book of fables about women, <laughs> a guide to the poetic life, and a book of true stories from Florida cemeteries. She serves as honorary chancellor of the Florida State Poets Association. Other strokes of luck include the Iowa Poetry Prize, two NEAs, two Florida Book Awards, the Florida's Eden Prize for Environmental Writing, and the Emily Dickinson Prize from the Poetry Society of America. Visit her at lolahaskins.com. All right, thank you, Lola. If you just click um, the little mute button at the bottom left-hand corner, it should allow you to unmute yourself. Or I can do it here. Let me click that. Oh, I think you're still muted. Oh, there you go. Okay. Perfect. Uh, my poems are a little bit different because they're all quite short. So there's, you're going to have to hear a lot of them. But on the other hand, if you get bored, that's the, that's the good thing. They're over fast. So this book, I'd like to explain why it's called what it is, but I can't. There's no time. So I'm just going to do poems from each section. So the first section is about um, death, basically. And... So let's see, we'll start with this one. Mortality. 
Every thrown stone falls. But there is a moment first, as it hangs in the air, that the blurred hand that tossed it will not come again, thinks a stone as it flies. This one is a true story, and uh, it's about my father. I can't do it, said the coroner. I knew this man which was how my father came to lie on this cold steel table at all night with no one to probe his nakedness for the gap through which his life had billowed through a curtain. And then, like the scrim it was, disappears, disappeared. Down the hall, a bell rings. We hear it everywhere. This one is how, if you live, the next one is if, if you live in a city, you tend not to do everything that's possible to do in that city because it's always there. It's like being alive at all. So this poem is called, When You Live Under the Mountain. When you live under the mountain, you do not see the mountain. What mountain, you ask, stirring your tea? As your visitor falls silent, before the clouds. Now we're going to switch. I will, I will give you a quick hint. The reason I use John Clare as my guide to the journey is that these sections don't speak to each other at all. They don't like each other. And so it's, it's something to do with insanity and that's why I chose him. For many reasons I could go on, but I'm not going to. The second section is um, set in the natural world. And this poem is called In the Stark Lands. In the stark lands, there are no trees to slow the wind. Creatures underground come out only with the stars. There is no other light. The distance to the horizon is a fierce happiness. This is a portrait of my heart. And I'm gonna do a bunch of little tiny ones. They're called music boxes I'm selecting. And these are all, um, they're not from the book set in Florida, but these are all set in Florida, the poems are. I spent a lot of time in the water and in the woods. They're very short, so I'm just gonna say the title of the poem and keep going, okay? Luckily, beauty. Far over my head, a, an eagle crosses the dappled light and vanishes. No cry, no wing beat. Yet, I looked up. Kindness. A sweet gum reaches out from its roots on the hill to touch my window when it rains. Fickle. The leaves cling to each other in their drifts. The wind has abandoned them all. A loss. Across the lake, the leafless trees have turned to smoke. I'll say something quick about the next one. This is true. After a hurricane, I went out in a kayak to some islands. It's called post-traumatic. A printer, half buried in the sand. Intact, but mute forever. Where I live, we go watch the Perseids when they come. And I did. An eyebrow of light trailing a red cloud hisses out in the dark sea water, sky water, on which still float a million stars. 
Now, this book is the only book I've written that has a humor section. It's humor and surrealism, but I'm going to do a couple of hopefully stress-relieving poems, <laughs> maybe. Um, this one is called, it depends who you are. This one is called The Fruit Detective. On the table are traces of orange blood. There are also marks, probably made by some kind of knife. The orange has probably been sectioned by now, but there's always hope until you're sure. The detective takes a sample. Valencia, this year's crop. Dum, da dum, dum. The detective puts out an APB, someone with a grudge against fruit. He cruises the orchard, turns up only a few bruised individuals, probably died of falls. There are front page pictures of the orange. No one has seen it. They try putting up pictures around town. Still nothing. The detective gets a call. Yes, thanks, he says, and yes, I'll be right over. Another orange. This time they find a peel. It has been brutally torn and tossed in the wastebasket. Probably never knew what hit it, says the detective, looking sadly <laughs> at the remains. There is a third killing and a fourth. People are keeping their oranges indoors. <laughs> there is fear about that with oranges off the street, the killer may turn to apples or bananas. <laughs> the detective needs a breakthrough. He gets it. If you want to know who killed the oranges, says a muffled voice, come to the phone booth at the corner of 4th and Market. 20 minutes, it adds. The detective hurries on his coat. When he gets there, the phone is already ringing. It is the egg. I did it, said the egg. <laughs> I'll do it again. The detective is not surprised. No one but the egg could have been so hard boiled. <laughs> yeah, I know, it's kind of dumb. Um, <laughs> So this second one, I, I, I tutor at the library. I've done it for many years. I tutor, tutor adults in English. And one of my extra daughters is this adorable, wonderful 40-year-old Italian girl who has a little girl who's eight. And she liked this one so much she memorized it, believe it or not, and she recited it at school. So that made my life, right, worth coming. So this is called Robert and Christopher Up in a Tree. The um, title comes from, you know, when you were a little kid, K-I-S-S-I-N-G, -S -S that one. But actually, this is Robert Frost and Christopher Smart, and it's a tribute to the fact I stole their methods. So, something there is that doesn't love a squirrel. For squirrels amuse their sharp little teeth by gnawing on my siding. For squirrels eat food never meant for them. And when I say, did you think you had wings? They just laugh their nasty little squirrel laughs and go on feeding. For squirrels, scrabble upside the out, up the outside of my house and check me out through the window like bratty children. For I would enjoy blasting a squirrel. I start, start with water cannon, and if that didn't phase, then tear gas. For after that, I'd fire a warning shot over its furry little tail. And après ça, le squirrel stew. For squirrels are not cute. For squirrels have no redeeming social value. For no matter how a squirrel bats its big little eyes at me and dangles its little front paws, I would never, ever marry one. Okay, that's the end of the humor section. <laughs> I, I, there are other there are other ones in there. Actually, there are a couple I like better, but they read be they don't re go out loud very well. Okay, so the last section in this book that has some surreal stuff in that section too, some very different poems from anything I've done. Um, the last section goes to my second home, which is North Yorkshire. Live there and go back a couple months, maybe a little more every every year, except this year, unfortunately. 
Um, and so I'm really interested in local history. I've written quite a lot based on things I found in the library. It's not a big town, it's a market town. Um, but this, this is not one of those, except I'm going to read it out loud and it's historical is why I brought it up. A friend of mine found a stone. He didn't know what it was. And he's not, I mean, he left school young, but he's smart. So he went and figured out what it was. And what it was, was it was a plague stone. And I'm going to read this because I try to read one poem. I know everything by heart, but it's not good to do it like that all the time. It changes how you present things. So when I read it, it's different. So I'm going to read this, physically read it. I'm going to look at the words. I, I could recite it, but I'm not going to. So um, this is, this is uh, called Altar. Between Rilston and Craco, the plague stone lies, tangled in nettle and fern, where once the villagers in the one that had not sickened left sustenance for their neighbors in the other. Turnips and potatoes, tobacco and vinegar, and wool and mantles, cotton shifts tied with tea, car caps, scarves, trousers, and skirts for those cold with fever, then crept off home to sit by their fireside, from whence, though they found no tokens on their breasts or backs, nor risings under their ears or armpits, they swore they could feel in their chests the coughs that, that poured from the dying like the blood of Christ. And in the mornings, while their own babies slept, the pale faces of children, they all saw them, would drift over their roofs like mist off the hills, then vanish as if they had never been. There's lots like that in this section, but that's one of them. Okay, then um, there was a total eclipse of the moon and a friend of mine and I wanted to see stars the next night. We thought we'd see the stars. So it said the night after the total eclipse, we wanted to see stars. So we drove past the villages with their closed pubs past the odd house, past the darkened farmhouses, past the walled monks road, past Grassington. And after miles of dips and rises, we turned into a field. But the moon was so huge, so swollen, like lips after too much kissing, that it paled the sky and looking up, we could not be sure of anything. And if we had been adrift at sea, no sextant ever made could have saved us. This one is about my, one of my, I have many favorite walks. One reason I spend so much time there is I know the moors pretty well within 25 miles and I have a bus pass because I'm an old age pensioner. Um, so I can go out and walk the moors almost every day, and I do that. So across the tops, the path runs narrow through heather, whose purple sprigs, being Septembers, are edged with brown. A bleak, sacramental wind cleans us for Rilston Cross, and the miles that may remain unto us, may remain to us, under the dark gray roiling sky whose blue patches open and close in a blink. May no step we take go unnoticed. May we mark the whir and complaint of each flushed grouse. And may we glory in the cold forever. For it is the cold of the sea, of grass and heather and birds and sky and the breaking light that gleams wild and holy in our eyes. My um, companion in a lot of these things um, turned out to have a certain flaw, unfortunately. So this is what it is, and I understand it actually, I will say. It's called the hedgehog.
Walking on, a long, walking on the walled path, I came upon a dark brown brush just the size of my hand. From it poked a narrow snout, which when it sensed my boot, backed away as fast as it could. I know that rush, that flight. Real fear, imagine fear. It makes no never mind. There is something huddled in us all. So there's a theme that runs through this book of basically stars that show up and vanish during the course of the sections. And this last poem is, uh, the place I stay is an 18th century, it's my house, it's tiny, it's a terraced house, it's two up, two down. You can't close the door if you put a double bed in one of the bedrooms because it's too small. So it's, I mean, it's, it's not a fancy house. It's right on the street. It has a coal, a concrete little backyard, which used to be, they used to have the outhouse and the coal scuttle, coal shed in it. And now it's just a concrete yard because people don't have the outhouses or coal sheds. And it only had electricity and plumbing about 1960. So anyway, that's where I live. And this is called Constellated. When the atoms in my body return to stars, they will not remember this 5 a.m. out my window. Neither the moor asleep on her side or across her darkened hips, the scatters a bright yellow course. Thank you. Thank you so much. I can't believe that all of those just came right from from your mind and from your heart. I I don't have the power to to memorize my work like that. So that is just so incredible. Um, the link to purchase Asylum is in the chat once again. And now we'll move on to our final reader. Last but not least, Nancy Naomi Carlson. Nancy Naomi Carlson is a poet, translator, essayist, and editor, and has authored 10 titles, six translated. An Infusion of Violets, her second full-length poetry collection, was named a new and noteworthy title by the New York Times and reviewed by the Washington Post. Her translations have been finalists for both the Best Translated Book Award and the CLMP Firecracker Poetry Award, and she has received two literature translation grants from the NEA. Decorated by the French government with the French academic palms, her work has appeared in such journals as APR, the Georgia Review, the Parish Review, and Poetry. And I'll also give a shout out, we have some of Nancy's translations in this new issue of Poet Lore. Um, she is a professor of graduate school counseling at Walden University. Welcome, Nancy. Thank you, Emily. And um, the, well, the Writer's Center is actually where I took my first class in writing. That's where I got my start. And so many of us um, can say that. It's just a much needed place in, in physical, physical location and also in our hearts. So thank you for having me, and uh, thank you, audience, for coming. We can't do it without you, and this is probably my only social outlet of the weekend, so I appreciate that, and good to see some, some friends and, and new folks. And thank you to my fellow readers. Uh, we were going to do an April reading and celebrate our new books, and Lola was going to stay with me, and that didn't work, but um, this, this is... It's not as good, but it, it, it comes close. So I'm going to read one poem from the new book, which is no longer new, so I can't really say that, um, and some new poems, which are new, and if there's any time, a translation. So we'll keep track of the time there. This is a seasonal one, and in keeping with the musical themes that we've been hearing, um, it's called and I used to be a musician, so it's a former life here. It's called Awaking to Vivaldi's Four Seasons. The deer must wonder at this frosted sunrise, salt lick iced over, 
each linden limb doubled in weight, each blade of grass enclosed in its own sheath that splinters underfoot beneath a patchwork of Halloween leaves gathered like souls, unearthed and ambered. He pulls her back under the quilt and fingers the length of her sternum, as if burnishing a Chinese flute recovered after 9,000 years, made from the wing bone of an extinct bird. Music of the spheres, he whispers, and plays the sun at middle G. Then Venus, Mercury, the elements of fire, water, and air scale to the end, down to the scorched earth. And I don't know, everybody writing COVID poems, not writing COVID poems. That's all I seem to be able to do. Um, but a lot of poems, so I can't complain about that. Uh, this one is a villanelle. And um, I don't know about you, about waking up in the morning and not being able to get out of bed. And it's another day. So this villanelle is called Obad a different kind of obad than waking to the, the deer and Vivaldi. This is obad day 50. Another quarantine morning hovers over your bed to overtake the dark. There must be 50 ways to leave these covers. Sweep back the blackout curtains that shutter your eyes. Take a swipe at your alarm. Another quarantine morning hovers, spreads like birdsong, the clean scent of clover. Nothing can stop the sun's diurnal arc, not even the 50 ways to leave these covers. Your legs feel like peanut butter. You can't gather strength in your arms. Another quarantine morning hovers, no need to dress, don't stress or overthink and devote the day to your art. There must be 50 ways. To leave these covers, stop thinking of bodies that won't be recovered. Make a wish on the morning star. Another quarantine morning hovers. There must be a way to leave these covers. And I don't have me on speaker view, so I can see you because I want to be able to have a reaction. So thank you for your reaction. So I, I don't leave the house really. Um, I go out for medical appointments. I can count on my two hands how many times I have left the house other than to garden or walk the new puppy. Um, but I needed to have my mammogram. So I put it off for a month or two and and I went out and it happened, this is the time of the hydrangeas. Did you notice that this past season, they were everywhere, thick, and such huge globes. So this is called vigilance. Like immortals, they're reborn every year, despite the cutting back. My backyard hydrangeas robbed the azalea's light, beautiful, and deadly, laced with a compound that morphs into cyanide when consumed. Though dried and smoked, they yield a cheaper than pot high. My scientist's father never shared that trip with me, sticking to complacencies of soil and pH, acidic to yield true blue and alkaline for pink. Were he still alive, I'd have shared how I mistook a magnified view of COVID-19 for hydrangea with their clustered cells, like the mutinous clutch taken from my breast right after he died. After months of kill cure in my veins, then rads burning through the tumor bed, six years of screenings and self exams, looking for that thing you so don't want to find, my annual mammogram pilgrimage came due. Early pandemic, I put off the visit, cobwebs collecting beneath the side view mirrors of my car. But July brought a flattened curve and a lull in Maryland deaths, led me to don a mask from my chemo stash and hold my breath 
as images bloomed on the digital screen, cloudy as Saharan dust now on its northerly trek, swirling its plume to feather our sunsets with shades of scattered light. So I've been writing a lot of, thank you, I've been writing a lot of Jewish poems. Uh, I think maybe that was because of this, I can't help it, it's new, it just came, no one has copies of it, 101 Jewish poems for the third millennium, co-edited by Matthew Silverman and myself, and 101 poets, huge names, emerging names, um, Ilya Kaminsky, Ed Hirsch, David Lehman, um, and our local poets too, and if I say one, then they'll say, why didn't you sing me all, but there, there are many of them. So I read so many, we had 800 poems that were submitted and we picked 101. But then I thought, why am I not writing more Jewish poems? So this has started and I can't seem to stop. And this one was, um, this one was a title that came to me um, in a poetry group. We have one that meets whenever we meet, which is maybe once a year or sometimes three times a year and the title came and then the poem came it's called we weren't so jewish then dangling our faith on a golden chain we gave our children old testament names like matthew and aaron and ruth to honor the family dead who kept piling up faster each year a whirlwind of covered mirrors, black ribbons, and yardside candles burning in glass, and words like bracha and yisker at graveside prayer, layering stone upon stone like ancient tropes. But still we wedded outside the tribe, drawn to men who'd never donned a skull cap, yet stomped on glass, timid shards in their souls to prove their accepting love. Our mothers defied, turned away, and closed their eyes each Shabbat, gathering candlelight in their hands, a vigil to combat the dark they feared we brought upon ourselves, more dreadful than any epithet sprayed on our walls. And, oh good, this last one of mine that I'll read, um, you never have any secrets when you give poetry readings, so. <laughs> and this is with a nod to Elizabeth Bishop. Ode for three X's. Ex-husbands, like other catastrophes, come in threes. One dead, one fled to New York, and one out of touch. The lost and found blues can be sung in any key. Sometimes the one who's left is the one who leaves first, after years holding close the same grudge. Ex-husbands, leavers or left, come in threes. If shoe hits glass or glass hits shoe to seal the chuppah vows, it's always the glass that gets crushed. The lost and found blues can be sung. In any key, Erev, Shel, Shoshanim will not guarantee eternal evenings of roses and coos of doves. Ex-husbands, like celebrity deaths, come in threes, even marriages outside the fold. Years later, a new wedding band, and with luck, the lost and found blues won't be sung in my key, and no one will add to the wake of decrees voided ketubas, and deeds covered in dust. The lost and found blues can be sung in a brighter key. Ex-husbands, count them, come in threes. And the last poem that I'll read is a translation, can't do poetry readings without translations, Louis-Philippe d'Alembert from Haiti. Um, leads the nomadic life, lives in Paris, lives in Haiti, lived in Jerusalem, lives in Italy, travels all around, um, writing short stories and poetry, and I'm working on both of those. And this one is about the fire in Notre Dame. And just read a little bit of French, so you hear these sounds. I'm attracted to his work because of the richness of the, the assonance and the alliteration. 
Notre-Dame de Paris. J'ai vu une cathédrale brûlée emportant en fumée la mémoire d'un peuple et des enfants pierre à la main s'obstiner à la remettre debout. J'ai vu une cathédrale brûlée, c'était à l'aube d'une année nouvelle ou au matin de la sainte saison, je n'en ai plus souvenir, et l'Atlantique en vain s'agenouillait pour recueillir les cendres. I'll skip the last answer. Notre Dame de Paris. I saw a cathedral burn, smoke sweeping away the memory of a nation, children with stones in hand, persisting in making it upright again. I saw a cathedral burn. It was on the dawn of another year or the start of a holy week I no longer recall. And in vain, the Atlantic kneeled to gather the ashes. I saw a cathedral be consumed like an ancient forest. Women and men wept, tears pale with shock. Mine then brought back lost cathedrals of childhood, whose vaults will no longer quake with heroic words. Thank you very much. Thank you, that was wonderful. It's always nice to hear some published work, some new work, a great mix of everything. Um, and thank you to all of our readers. I think it was just a great um, collection of so many different types of poetry. Um, so it's great to have everyone here together. Um, we have some time for a little bit of a Q and A. Um, I don't see any specific questions. Oh, there's a question. Um, what is the name of the poet Nancy just read? Um, I think Nancy is typing that into the chat. Um, but I have a few kind of more general poetry questions, maybe to get us started. If our readers wanted to chat a little bit, and then. Um, if anyone has a question, they can type it in the chat and we'll um, definitely get to it. Um, but I think, you know, a, an interesting place to start might be, um, and this is kind of jumping off of Nancy's poem that um, was kind of after an Elizabeth Bishop poem, but I'm wondering what poets you each are drawn to, um, maybe what poet you read that got you started in your poetry journey or who you're reading right now that continues to kind of um, inspire you to keep writing. I was going to ask Susan that, so maybe she'd like to answer. Oh, yes, I would love to, yes. Um, I've always been drawn to Charlie Simic, Simic's work and uh, continue to be drawn to it. Um, uh, he's of course a much writes poetry that are poems that are much shorter than mine and um, tries to get at the essence of things in less time than I do, which I envy a lot. And for the last three years, I have had by my side Anne Sexton's collected poetry. Mm -hmm. um, I am, I mean, there are many other poets, but that I'm drawn to, um, and have been drawn to. Wallace Stevens was one, uh, but I have not read anything by him for, for three years. And um, so the phenomenal rise of Anne Sexton is, is still a mystery to me. And uh, I, I, find, I'm, I find myself wishing for a resurrection of, of her and uh, for people not to belittle confessional poetry. I don't know if that answers your question, Lola. It's uh, whatever you want to say answered it. It did a great job. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. No, well, I'll go. Um, Emily Dickinson, of course. Um, I think I was initially drawn to the, the romantic figure of the poet in white hiding in her room, et cetera, et cetera. And perhaps when I was younger, I didn't really grasp 
you know, how much was going on there. But she's just been a constant, uh, a constant inspiration to me. Uh, I love the late poet Deborah Diggs, who I wrote my dissertation on in uh, grad school. Uh, again, just flights of words. Um, speaking of words, uh, Adrian Blevins, a poet who... I guess she teaches in Maine now, but she's from Appalachia. And she's this very, ah, what's the word? Loquacious, very loquacious poet on the page. And uh, I, reading her gave me the freedom to feel like I could do that. And what was my fourth one? Oh, Plath. I, Sylvia Plath scares me a bit, not for the reasons you would think, uh, but just because her intellect is so sharp and so daunting, and I appreciate so much more that's in her work that goes beyond what, you know, the stereotypes of her, just as with Dickinson. Um, definitely worth checking out. I, I seem to remember Stanley Plumley, who was a teacher of mine, um, talking about her as this superb nature poet, and I hadn't really thought about it until he mentioned it. Lola or Nancy, do you have any, anyone that jumps to mind? You want to go first, Nancy, or shall I? Why don't you, Lola? Okay, well, if you'd seen this book, you'd see how wide my taste is. And so I read a lot of ancient Chinese poets. I read Arabic poets. I read Central European poets. Um, I like certain poems of Merwin beyond loving. I love them. Um, so, uh, Emily Dickinson is really important. And when I was little, um, there was no music in my house, and my mother was abusive. And the only music there was, there was some. It was all musical comedies, records. So I memorized every song and every record we had when I was four, five, six, seven. And then when I hit school, um, I found the highwayman, and when I was in fifth grade, you had to do something for a, a parents' evening, and it was my favorite poem, and I recited the whole thing, and I used to recite it every semester to each computer science class I taught, because they need to hear good stories. You know, I adore Yeats. I adore Auden. I love so many poets. You, I mean, if you see that bookcase, <laughs> all of that right there is poetry I love. I could turn around and read you name after name after name of people whose work I admire beyond admiration. You know, I mean, I just, I read all the time. I read like Art, R.T. Thomas, a British poet, um, who was a, a, a minister. Uh, certain of his poems, I mean, but there's so many. I can't even start, honestly, truly. And I must say, you know what, Nancy, this is going to interest you sort of. Um, I never really related to Baudelaire until I started reading him in French. And that's why I've translated a whole manuscript of him, which I can't get published because anybody, I mean, it's not, I didn't read Byman and meter it, first of all. But secondly, anyone who would like to um, publish a new version of Baudelaire, which I think there's, I think it's the right time to do that. But no dead white men and no sexist men you know, and there's no chance in hell because if the press would look at my work, which a couple of them have, they send them out to academics who complain I don't copy his exact rhyme and meter. So I'll never do that. But anyway, I really actually have ended up loving Baudelaire, especially the prose poems. Those are the ones I just love. There's one called Chacun Sans Chimere. You know that one, Nancy? Like, each to each his chimera. Yeah, I love that one. And I love the one about the Chinese. The first line that I translated was the Chinese tell time by the eyes of cats. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's just so staggeringly imaginative and people don't appreciate him. Well, we published some of those in Tupelo Quarterly. Yeah, I know. Yes, you did. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, I've got lots more where this came from, you know. I mean, but no, this is, but, but I... I hate to say which poem, you know, the truth is, here's the deal, actually, is it's, I, if people ask me that, I always say, I can't tell you that, but I can tell you which poems, because I put, do you know those winter Sundays, everybody knows that poem? 
Well, I put poems on my door. I was never at a class in computer science, but I taught at university level for 28 years. And I would put a poem on my door and I would make my students read the poem before they could come in. And I'd, I'm not quizzing them on or anything, but I want them to see what else there is in the world. And a kid came into me, an accounting major with his program under his arm. And he came in and I said, what can I do for you? And he said, well, I saw the poem on your door. And I said, yeah, it's a really fine poem. Nobody is, I can recite that one. I can recite a lot of other people's. But anyway, I said, you know, nobody's ever written a poem, which is so perfect for what it does. He said, yes, and I am going to go to my father's grave now. He drove two and a half hours to Tampa to tell his father he understood now mm -hmm. after reading that poem. Hmm. I mean, that just gives you some idea of how incredibly powerful certain poems are to certain people. So, I mean, I, I could talk all day about the ones I love, but you don't want to hear that. So let's talk, ask somebody else something. So I guess it's me. And uh, yep. I, for me, I came to poetry through French. So it's the romantic poets, Verlaine, Rimbaud, Baudelaire, that captivated me. I studied French language and literature. I had to read a hundred works of writing for my master's comps. So I was um, seeped into, steeped into this French literature. And René Schall was one of the ones who was just very young at the time that I got my master's and then lived a whole career afterwards. So I, he was the first person I translated. Uh, very different from my style, prose poems. Um, and that made me start writing prose poems. What do I read now? I'm, I'm constantly reading. I have stacks everywhere. But what I do is I read through magazines. So I have all these voices in my head. And that's how I first came to know Lola. I didn't know her, but she was always in the Georgia Review. So I would see her poems and get a sense of her. And um, so I read certain magazines religiously, cover to cover, look at the bios of everybody still, see what, what, what will click. When I'm writing a poem, I have maybe an idea of a topic, but it's not going anywhere until I get some, some stuff going. So maybe in the magazine, someone I don't know says something that gives me that missing link that gives me the power to feel I can actually sit in front of the computer and start to write something. And then looking, I, I research the topic to see what history there is to it or something to get more ideas. And then by the time I'm done, after telling myself that I'll never write a poem, <laughs> Emily knows, <laughs> I won't write a poem this session. It'll never happen. Um, but by getting all that stuff in, and it's usually Friday night, and my head is like exhausted from everything else, and then that helps me write. So I look to other poets for inspiration. I look to other poets to see that, yes, people can still write poems and get them on paper, um, and Stanley Plumley's work, amazing, going and reading it over and over. Some of, uh, of us here in this group attended his workshops, and uh, he made a really strong impression on me, Michael Collier. Um, yeah. Can I add one thing? Yeah. Uh, we tend not to look back much. John Donne is an incredible poet. There are some poets from centuries ago that if you just go get the Oxford anthology and you start reading back, you will just be astounded at how beautiful their poems are. And you, you will have associated them with high school or something. I mean, I never went to English graduate school, I, not what I studied. Um, but just when you get back to them, you will be thrilled and you won't realize what you've been missing reading only 20th century mm. is what I'm trying to say. Because I, I read ancient Chinese poetry a lot, but I mean, beyond that, just the English language stuff, which is like, take Chaucer. I did that with a seventh grade class one time. And these I asked, used to ask to be given classes whose um, teachers, well, the kids come from the wrong side of the tracks. Those are the ones I like. And... Um, I ran out of material, and the last day, 
I did, I decided to do the prologue to the Canterbury Tales, you know, Clemente was the Shah Resort of the Doctor March and so on. Well, I did that with them. And I told them, look, you, you know, you listen to music and you don't understand the words. It's no sweat, right? You just like, like the way it sounds, right? And they said, yeah. So, okay, so don't pay any attention to the words. I'm just going to tell you this thing and pretend it's a song. And when I finished, this kid in the back of the room who's, I mean, he comes from a druggy family. He's a great kid. And he said, what's that mean? And I said, well, you know, why don't we look at it? And they went out buzzing. They translated the whole prologue all by themselves with a little help. And they loved Chaucer. So we underestimate, underestimate extremely how much people can grasp from things which were written centuries ago and not in our current language. I just I want to put in a word for that because we tend to forget it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, another one of my questions is kind of about writing process. I know you've each had um, many different projects, either maybe going at the same time or one's published and you're quickly working on the next. So I wonder um, over time how you see your process changing or if you see it changing at all. Um, does it differ depending on what project you're working on at the time? I don't know, who, whoever wants to jump in can go ahead. I can answer uh, fairly briefly. About three years ago, I started, uh, that's when I was diagnosed with having bipolar too, but I, I began writing with so much internal rhyme that it scared me. And it was happening so fast, That's that was, a pretty much a manic phase, but it hasn't really left and I'm not scared of it anymore. Um, but it was never present. And that's what's so strange about it, uh, that it was really just three years ago. And I, I should mention too, that I, I have a pile of books and magazines by my side. Uh, like Nancy, I too uh, find reading through magazines that I get uh, very helpful. And I, and I have a library outside filled with books. I also find fiction uh, quite uh, um, useful when I'm, when I'm writing, even if I just read a short story. I don't have to read it to conclusion, just read through. It, it just starts to make things percolate for me. And, that's, and then I can take off. And, and, and the joy is, it, it is very hard to get it all down, but the joy is the revision. For me, that is the joy, to have something there that I know I will be revising maybe for days, maybe for a week. And maybe years. Yeah, maybe years, exactly. And I just want to mention one other thing. I just uh, adored everybody's reading, and everybody was different, and it was uh, an honor and a pleasure to read with all of you. So. So I can jump in about um, writing in that these last six months have been a window into my process. Uh, there are not a lot of distractions. I teach an, in a grad program in counseling, and that's, that's the distraction. But I have all this time to write. And I always wondered, would that make me write more, or would it not? And the secret is it does make me write more. <laughs> and I'm now writing essays. And so when I sit down to write, it's, do I feel an essay coming on? Do I feel a poem coming on? Or if none of that is happening, I can always translate. And I can always translate, which means the first step is laboriously looking and interrogating every word on that page, looking at different dictionaries and looking them up in English. And so I can go through that um, to get myself started writing. And sometimes that pulls me right in. And now I have a choice with translation. So I'm juggling D'Alembert, the Haitian poet. I just finished translating Alain Maboncou from Congo Brazzaville. He has two, two books that I finished and sent in. Um, and then I started translating a Swedish poet. So Stig Daggerman is 
the father of a good friend of mine, Lou Daggerman. And her mission is to bring his work into English. He grew up in the 19, uh, well, he wrote profusely in the 1950s and then killed himself at age 31. Hmm. Um, but wrote novels and poetry and um, poems that were daily verses in the paper. And Emily heard the Birgitta Suite that I read in that class. And with Lou, I was able to then access the Swedish and the music of the Swedish and then put my poet's mind in with her knowledge of uh, Swedish. So she's getting to be a pretty darn good translator herself. Um, and so we, we did that and we've moved on to other poems and now I'm, I've started, I've done some Neruda before, but I'm, uh, collaborating with, uh, many of you may know Hope Maxwell Snyder, who now goes by Esperanza Hope Snyder, and we're collaborating, translating Wendy Guerra, who is from Cuba. And I love the fact that I'm translating a woman and I'm co-translating with a woman. Um, so it seems like there's just so much to be writing and I'm, I amaze myself, but it's like walking the tightrope between two high risers. If I look down and say, this is what I'm doing, it'll all stop. Mm -hmm. So I just keep looking straight ahead and keep on producing. Can I add a couple things? Um, I, I'm translating one of my books into Spanish, and I've translated one poem. I'm really happy with that translation, not from that book. But what I was going to say is that, um, first of all, I, I forgot to, do, I wasn't going to do this poem, but I'm going to do it as to myself. And it's, it's a comment on my productivity during the COVID epic. And it says, so much awful poetry. Come on, vaccine. <laughs> So that's, that's my uh, comment on myself. But the second thing is I've written an awful lot of monologues in um, voices of people from other centuries and in other countries. And I researched them very, very heavily. I've written a lot of that stuff. I stopped doing it because I, when I get comfortable with something, I don't do it anymore. That's why the um, asylum is so weirdly formatted because I don't want to, um, I want to risk everything every time I write something which means that I have to drop what I was doing that was working really well because it got easy. <laughs> I mean, I don't mean easy, but I could, I could crank it out. And the minute I could crank it out, I had to stop doing it. So I did finally stop doing uh, monologues, although I've done a couple since, but years later. The one I have now that is about an alchemist and her greedy his greedy daughter, um, but that's one off. I don't usually, I'm not doing that much anymore. So I just wanted to say that research is a wonderful thing. Reading around uh, when you want to write in somebody else's voice is completely thrilling to me. I mean, I read a lot of history, but just, I don't know, I can't explain it. If you come across a real person who keeps a diary, it's just very exciting. And it can inspire you to real heights. Um, yeah, wanted to get a few thoughts in here. Um, I... I'm very unlike Susan and the others in that I hate revising. I, I just oh, I love it in revising, but I'm incredibly fruitful with first drafts. So following through on that is hard. Um, when the pandemic started and we were spending more time at home, well, for one thing, as an introvert who currently isn't employed, it hasn't been that different to me to be here in my house, but I dug out this room that was supposed to be my office, but just had boxes and all this other stuff in it. And now it has boxes and other stuff in it again, but it also has me and a space for me to write and to do Zoom calls. And uh, carving out that space was really important to me. Um, and one of the main things that inspires me lately is, uh, is film or video. Uh, I got three poems out of watching a video recording of Deep Purple at the Playboy Mansion. It's not something I would have expected to write about. I just wrote a poem about uh, Diana Barrymore being interviewed by Mike Wallace. Fantastic interview. All you need to know, on, you know, the short answer on Diana Barrymore is that she wrote a book called Too Fast, No, Too Much, Too Soon. So it's one of those kind of things. Um, 
Yeah. I'm glad you said that. That's a really important thing to say. But the space. For the... Bringing up video and film and so forth, that's great. Because it's as close as you can get to an actual encounter with someone. So you've got visual right. clues as well as auditory clues. You can look around in the space. That's you're not looking at words. You're looking at visuals. Yeah. And it makes a difference. Yeah. And music, too. Same thing. Yeah. For a different kind of inspiration. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um, so we are coming up right on 3.30. Um, and I want to be conscious of everyone's time. And just thank you to all four of our readers and our audience for um, this afternoon of poetry. It's just been so great to to hear so many different poems and to get to spend some time talking about craft and inspiration. Um, I know that I've enjoyed this afternoon immensely. Um, so thank you all for coming. I don't know if the readers want to say any last words before we... I, I want to say that I just deeply appreciate the other poets whose work I heard. I love hearing things which sound so much themselves. And I also really appreciate all the audience that stuck with it. Thank you very much, audience, for coming at all. And for those of you who are still here, you're, you're uh, whatever you are, thank you. <laughs> and thank you for having this and letting me come. Thank you, everybody. All right. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. See you later. Enjoy your afternoon. Thank you all.